Hi, and welcome to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Today, I'm speaking with Julian Uccello. He's a soccer superstar whose career was cut short by a horrible disease, multiple sclerosis. Most people call it MS. His story is both heartbreaking and inspirational. March is MS Awareness Month. MS is believed to be an autoimmune condition in which the immune system mistakenly attacks normal tissues. These are the myelin sheaths that normally protect nerve fibers in the brain, spinal cord, and optic nerve. As the myelin sheath is gradually destroyed, the resulting scar tissue, sclerosis, disrupts the electrical impulses between the brain and other parts of the body. Many of us know people who have been struck by this disease. MS affects millions of people around the world. Let's hear Julian's story. So we're going to start at the beginning of your story. You started playing soccer when you were a really young kid. Yeah, I started uh, I mean, playing soccer when I was about three years old. I mean, at the end of the day, playing when you're that young, it's more of, you know, let's go pick dandelions off a soccer field and just pick the ball <laughs> once in a while. Um, but I would say that, yeah, like the starting point was, you know, three years old because looking back at it, I, I had my first like medal of from 1989. So that's how I always backtracked. So I started when I was three because of the fact that I have that one medal, which nowadays is like, 30 years old and it's like rusting and it's, you know, it can't even make out that it's 89 anymore. But, um, uh, yeah, I started when I was three years old. Um, obviously as I was getting older, I started realizing that, you know, the sport was something that I love to do. Um, I would say up until about nine, I was more in the recreational type soccer world. Um, until I, again, realized that, you know, maybe I should go into the competitive side of it. Um, now, while going into the competitive side of it, I also started training much harder than kids my age, uh, in a sense that I would, uh, I had my own trainer that I would go see him two to three times. Um, well, I would train for soccer three times a day. I would see him always one time a day, you know, seven days a week, um, until I was about, 14, where I went to England for about five months uh, with Manchester United. Um, playing with Manchester United, I didn't, I wasn't able to get my passport in time, uh, so I had to come back to Canada. Uh, coming back to Canada, um, I was playing with the Woodbridge Strikers uh, and was noticed by a scout from Italy uh, who was here. Uh, in in Woodbridge, uh, watching this one tournament that Woodbridge always holds, and he had mentioned to me that he wanted to bring me down to Italy um, to Lazio, which is a team in Italy. Um, and how that worked out was when I got to Italy. Uh, apparently, Lazio wasn't in preseason yet, so they had organized with AC Milan for me to go there for a couple of days just to you know get my legs moving. Um, but after about three days. Uh, with AC Milan, they wanted to sign me right away. And from that day forward is when I started my soccer career. <laughs> so that's how I ended up in Italy. Um, you know, and being 15 years old, playing for the richest, cl- for the richest club in the world um, is every kid's dream, of course. Um, and then from there onward, um, you know, being from, you know, doing the AC Milan youth all the way till the, uh, the Primavera side, it's, um, I was put on loan to other teams in Europe and Italy. I say Europe, but I mean Italy. Um, You know, every year getting better, 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 scoring more goals, and finally ending up in um, Serie B with uh, Crotone in 2011, um, which is when it all happened with with the MS. Wow. So I bet your parents were proud, proud, proud. Uh, My parents were very proud uh, just because of the fact that you know, I, I followed a dream and I made the dream come true, uh, which, I mean, I, I'm sure that every parent wants to see their kids succeed, um, even though it was very stressful and, um, you know, it wasn't something easy because um, it took a lot of courage and strength for me to pick up and leave, leaving behind friends, leaving behind all my family um, and just moving to a foreign country because at the end of the day, I didn't know how to read, write or speak uh, Italian, so I had to learn. I had to learn that all on my own um, while being in Italy. So, 
for a parent, it's kind of scary. I bet um, understanding that you know your your child is in a different country, doesn't know how to speak a language, doesn't know how to uh, get around, and but you know I basically put it all on my shoulders and said that's ah, okay, I'll be fine. <laughs> hmm. Okay, but I mean. There's no better learning than to be totally immersed in a language <laughs> and a culture. You learn it really fast, especially when you're young, right? You pick up on these things so quickly. And yeah, especially when you don't have a choice. I mean, at the end of the day, if you wanted to speak to your teammates, your coaches, and you couldn't speak in English, they would look at you like, what was this guy saying? Um, <laughs> and they didn't have an issue letting you know, like, if, you know, hurry up and start talking type thing. <laughs> um, so it was more of like a grade one Italian learning lesson, like, oh, they'd pick up a fork and they'd be like, oh, forchetta, fork. And you'd be like, oh, okay. And then they would just do that like 10,000 times and you finally know that it was a fork. Yeah. But that's how it sort of, you know, that's how it sort of happened. But it's a lot of fun at the time. It, actually, at the time, it's not. <laughs> you like, uh, no, at the time, it's stressful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you go to sleep at night and you're just so exhausted because you've been thinking. Oh, yeah. And at the beginning, you hear it in Italian, translate that Italian in your head, answer yeah. yourself in English. And by the time you spit out the answer in the language that you're learning, you're, you know, the conversation's moved so far on that what you're saying doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, no, that's correct. And it's, um, I mean, nowadays when, when it's, it's funny because nowadays when someone speaks to me in English, I'm actually thinking it in Italian, which is weird. Like it, it totally reversed how my train of thought was. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it I mean, listen, it, it was an amazing life experience. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of great things, uh, that happened and a lot of great things that I will always look for, like, look forward to and speak to my daughter about it. Um, and I'll always have memories in my mind that I wouldn't change for anything in the world. Okay. So walk us through what happened when you started to feel that something wasn't right. So in 2011, I had uh, the exact moment I was, I think it was February 17th, um, of 2011. I had woken up, I had fallen asleep on the couch and I'd woken up the next morning with a severe numbness in my right arm. So from the top of the shoulder all the way to the fingertips, uh, it was more of a numbness and burning sensation. Um, so it was almost like when you hit your funny bone, you feel sort of like uh, something not right, but it was something that didn't go away. So it wasn't like it stayed for five minutes, 10 minutes. It was constant 24 hours a day. Um, going to the field I was speaking, I, I spoke to obviously, you know, cause we had a medical team and I'd spoke to my, the doctors there and, you know, they were more on the, oh, it's a pinched nerve type of alleyway. And just to see how it goes over the next couple of days, if it goes away, you know, you know there's massages, there was ultrasounds, there was different type of things that they were doing for therapy. Um, but it started getting worse and worse and worse every day. So this was after about a week uh, when the burning was actually getting worse, I wasn't able to even... My, hand, my arm would have to be under cold water because it just felt like it was on fire. Um, at that point there, the doctors had said, listen, you need to go to the hospital, go get MRIs, CAT scans, spinal taps, whatever you can get to see what's going on. You know, maybe you have a damaged nerve or who knows. Um, so I did that. Um, now at this point, sorry to interrupt you, but at this point, were you thinking that it was probably a, an injury from soccer? Because soccer, although 100%. it looks like you're just running around a field, but you guys are falling and tumbling and you don't wear equipment. Um, you, you think that it might have been some sort of injury, um, whether from a fall. So that could have yeah. been a pinch nerve or that could have been a, a, you know, a disc, a urinated disc, or that could have been something that maybe was, uh, just not lining up properly in your spinal cord. But I mean, I never thought that it was a neurological disease. That's for sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, true. Impossible. And I'm not impossible because everything is possible. It's just that when you put your body through that lifestyle where you're eating properly, you're training every day, you're staying healthy, you're you know not smoking, not doing drugs, not doing that. You don't think that something like that can just in the blink of an eye come forth. Um, so that brought me to a week in the hospital uh, where I got all the results back and the doctor literally walked into the room and I remember she walked in and she's like, her exact words were, 
I'm very sorry to say this, and it's in Italian, obviously, I'm very sorry to say this, but you do have multiple sclerosis and you're going to be in a wheelchair in six months. Oh my God. Those were the exact words. Now saying that, I didn't have my family there. I didn't have anything there. So I was by myself. So you, the whole world sort of just came down on me because you don't know what to do next. Oh, it um, must have been devastating. It was. It, it was very, very, very difficult for me. But, I mean, it was it was something that you look back now and you could sort of, you know you can get through anything because you got through that. Yeah. Um, after I was diagnosed, uh, then it just started tumbling downwards. Uh, I had five years left on my contract. Contract was cut. Uh, they basically said, thank you very much. I got back on a plane, came back to Canada. I, in my mind, thought that it was not true. So when I came back to Canada, I redid all the tests again because I said, maybe, who knows? Yeah. Maybe it's a conspiracy. Maybe it's something <laughs> that they just made up and they wanted to kick me out. Like, I don't know. But again, did all the tests here and it verified that, yeah, it is, it is what it is. And, um, I mean, it's been 11 years or 10 years now, and I'm not in a wheelchair. I mean, I'm walking with a cane, but not in a wheelchair, which I look at as a positive. Absolutely. So how old were yeah. you at that time? I was 25. 25 years old. That's so young. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so. Yeah, it was, it was at the middle of my career, I would say. Um, it was something that I. Uh, you know, I was with the Canadian men's national team. Um, I was at the highest level of play that I could have been at in Europe. Um, you know, making good money, uh, making a living for myself. Um, but at a blink of an eye, it just all disappeared. That's why people, in my opinion, should never take anything for granted. Um, because even, let's say I'm driving nowadays, you know, you see someone running and something as easy as running that I can't do, you sort of not envy that person, but you automatically, your brain goes back to why can't I do that anymore? I mean, I find it difficult to walk a kilometer now, not even to walk to my mailbox. Wow. And it's like from being at one level playing against the best players in the world, the best athletes in the world to now not even being able to walk my dog. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, they have the, hard. um, the worldwide international, uh, athlete of the year competition every year and nine times out of ten it that that competition is won by a soccer player because the stamina required yeah. and the strength required you're in top physical shape to play a yeah. sport like soccer yeah it's uh you have to be especially your endurance side of it and there's always you know the different different positions that you play in soccer one you need more endurance one you need more agility one you need more speed when you need more strength. It all depends on where you're situated on the field. But, um, you know, and I've always, I, I always get asked that question. Oh yeah. But when you guys get hit, you know, you're rolling around like you're like, you know, someone died on the field. And it's like, well, no, there's a, there's a certain reason why soccer players actually will stay down for that minute or two. And you're like, Oh yeah. Why? Cause you guys are babies. And it's like, well, no, we're, taught in our minds to when we're down we're allowing our teammates to rest people don't look at it that way that's why if you see a player down for 30 40 50 seconds they're allowing their players to rest because it is a non-stop 90 minute game you're not in hockey where you're on for a minute and off for four minutes mm -hmm. you're on doing whatever you have to do for a 90 minute game that's funny. That's a sneaky move. <laughs> it is. It is. And we'd always grab our trainer's ankle if we were okay. And if we didn't grab it, something was like, you're actually hurt. So it was just, it was little things that you, you learned growing up in the soccer world. Now, when you've started playing a sport at such a young age, and then you progress in the way that you did, you obviously had a talent. Uh, you're not the run yeah. of the mill, you know, five-year-old on the soccer field that somebody recognized mm -hmm. that you had some really good potential here and you become Julian, the soccer player. Mm -hmm. And when the blink of an eye, when you're all of a sudden, not Julian, the soccer player, yep. who are you? It's been 10 years and I still don't have that answer. I still think of that every day. What am I? 
who am I? What have I become? You always look back at I was a soccer player. Um, and, you know, it's funny that you see, let's say you see someone that the last time you saw was when you were in Italy. They'll be, you know, their first thing is, oh, you're back. What did you do? Give up? And it's just like, dude, like, really? Like, no one, everyone assumes these these days and no one really understands that everyone has their own story. Um, and it makes it that much harder to accept that the soccer world isn't there anymore and now there's a new world that you have to live by. So, a new, to, <laughs> yeah, a new world that you have to learn as if you're starting all over again because it's a whole new identity, yeah. isn't it? It is a brand new identity and it's something that takes a lot of strength because all I know is soccer, literally. Mm -hmm. And even as a player, you don't get to, you, you see it, but you don't actually get to, to be a part of the business end of soccer. You're busy. You're busy. You're training all the time. How, how, what was your yep. training schedule like? Uh, well, when I was in Europe, it was always, it was every day. Um, every day. but then it was, yeah, yeah, it was every day. And then obviously, you know, there was a lot of flights because if you had a game that you had to fly out to, you would, you know, so you'd have to do a day of traveling or, um, but it was just always on the go, 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 go. I mean, yes. Okay. Training sessions were, you know, let's just say two to five, but your mindset is still, like you wake up in the morning, you're preparing for your practice session. And then after practice, you're preparing to get your rest so that you're ready for tomorrow. So it was always, a, 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 you know, you're always in your mind thinking of soccer. It was never, oh, you go to work at nine to four. And then at four o'clock, you can just close your brain off and say, I just go back to work tomorrow at nine and do the same thing. It was never that. It was always something different. Mm -hmm. And then one day you wake up with a numb arm. Yeah. And, and a week later... It's all over. Yeah. A week later, it's all gone. That must have been devastating. It, it, like I said, it was the hardest, hardest thing in the world for me. It was something that I still to this day don't know if I accept it. I say I do, but I don't know if I do. Now, did you know anything about MS when they said you have Zero. multiple sclerosis? Zero. I didn't know anything about it. And what's funny is that you know, as much as I said, oh, don't take for granted of what you can do. Um, it's funny because, you know, you would go to your training sessions and you'd be like, oh, my God, this is like in your mind. Like, oh, this is so hard. This is so hard. This is so hard. But you're actually able to do something that is hard. So now looking at it where it's like, oh, it's so hard to walk. It's so hard to walk and not being able to walk. It, it's a very thin line of how your brain reacts. And they say the brain is the strongest and most powerful thing in the world. And it 100% is. What did your parents say when you called them? Um, they couldn't believe, they couldn't believe that their son, who was an athlete, was diagnosed with something that was career ending. My dad was in di denial up until maybe two years ago. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So it really, it really it, impacted them. Oh yeah, and it, yeah, it did, it did, it did, and um, especially because of the fact of oh, like even when I was younger, I was misdiagnosed with cancer, and that was you know so it hit their hard, it hit their lives as well when I was younger. So they were saying, well, maybe this is a misdiagnosis too. So on their mind or my dad's mind, it was, oh, you don't have MS. There's no way. But up until about two years ago, with or without the results, I'd say, yes, you do have it. Like, it's plain in black and white. Like, there's nothing you can make it up. Um, it was like his brain wasn't allowing him to, to accept it. Wow. Well, that's the thing yeah. with a lot of these diseases, and people need to know that, that with an autoimmune disease like MS, you, it doesn't just affect you, although it affects you profoundly. It also affects yeah. the people who love you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it affects every single person in your life, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, whether you're, you know, you're married, you have kids, it makes no difference. And it's, um, it's hard just because of the fact that your brain and mind, um, the way you react and the way you are as a person, it shows to everyone else. So whether they feel bad for you or they 
you know, they're there to support you or they're there to, to let you know that it's okay. It makes it that much harder for them because it's like a different step in their mind that they got to do. Right. Well, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Julian. Uh, You're listening to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and we are talking this morning about MS and how it affects you. Um, Julian, we are really appreciating you sharing your story with us, and we'll continue the story right after this. Hi, this is Bren Masson, host of Fresh Waves. Fresh Waves brings you awareness, compassion, understanding, respect, and discovery in the stories of people's lives. Enhance your day with creativity and wonderment on Fresh Waves. Fresh Waves can be heard every day, anytime you like at freshwaves.ca. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Fresh Waves Radio, and listen every Saturday morning at 7 a.m. on 102.9 whistlefm.com. Fresh Waves, it really is fresh. We're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. We're speaking with Julian Uccello this morning. He's a former world-class soccer player who was tragically hit with MS and is now living a completely different life. So you came home from Europe with the diagnosis and you got tested here and they came up with the same diagnosis of MS. And then what happened? It was, I mean, I was diagnosed with MS, came home. Um, When I came home, I would say for about a year or two years, uh, it was a serious depression um, because of the fact that your mind, again, didn't accept that your life was completely changed. Um, so serious depression, meaning I don't even think I left the house. Um, I was just very sad, closed off. I uh, didn't want to see anyone or speak to anyone. Um, was just deeply hurting inside and not even hurting because of the diagnosis, but I was hurting because I didn't know anything else but soccer. Um, after I got out of that sort of bout, um, I had uh, gone into real estate um, because, again, I looked at it as real estate was something that I can do on my own time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do the schooling, do whatever I need to do, and and if I want to go out and become a real estate agent, I can be out and try selling house. Um, did that for a couple of years. I tried to, my dad was a real estate agent. He's been a real estate agent for about 25 years now. Um, so I thought I would just, you know, piggyback and spend more time with him and, you know, be able to, to maybe get my mind off of things. Uh, and then after about, that got me to about 2014. And then in 2014, I started uh, working with State Few Homes, um, doing all the sales for them. Um, and that, and then I slowly moved up the, the ladder in a sense of doing the sales and then doing sales and marketing, um, and then moving into more of a managerial role of sales and marketing, um, to now becoming the, you know, the VP of operations of sales and, op- and marketing. So I manage anything that has to do with the sales side of it for safety homes. Um, and then either the marketing that has to do with safety homes, uh, whether that's, you know, sponsors, whether that's. Um, you know, upcoming sites. Um, and I just do that now on a daily basis. And what is the state of your MS, if you don't mind me asking? So right now, the, I mean, it's progressing in a sense that I walk constantly with a cane. Um, the right side of my leg or my body is, is a lot weaker um, than my left side. So having to walk with a cane. If I don't walk with a cane, my leg will obviously it drags and I trip over. I can trip. I will trip over my feet and what just caused me to cause me to fall multiple times. Um, you know, in uh, having a daughter and having that, uh, that fear of, you know, picking her up and not being able to, um, to walk with her down the stairs or to, uh, pick her up and just walk around the house need be, or even go for a walk with her is, is always a fear in my mind because anything could happen. Um, another thing with MS is that you could wake up and be in a wheelchair and you just don't know. 
so you never know what tomorrow brings you. And I have to say that from every morning that I wake up, the first thing I do is I wiggle my toes and I move my leg just to see that, okay, you know, not today. Because it is something that is a fear in the back of my mind that you might wake up and you might be completely paralyzed or you might be not able to walk or the, the strength in your right leg and might move to your left leg where you have no choice but to be in a wheelchair in order to commute. Right. And how's your arm doing? Um, for me, it's fine. But if anyone else like will they could touch it or it still feels like how it did when it first happened. I mean, now I find like even writing with a pen um, or, you know, taking notes, it makes it very difficult to write just because of the strength in my fingers and hands is very weak. Wow. What a journey. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It really is something. So do you actually um, speak about MS and, and try and bring awareness to this really awful disease? Yeah, I, I, I'm so I'm a lead ambassador for MS for MS, and our main goal is um, to raise money for the John Hopkins Hospital, uh, which is in uh, Maryland, um, for their whole research of MS. Uh, because there is no cure for MS, um, you know, trying to raise as much money to help for the research of it because it is something that is needed. Um, I do. I do like to fundraise a lot. I mean, from April 1st, to April 16th, I'm going to be doing, which is going to be very, very difficult. Um, I'm going to try and walk, which is all, you know, documented. It's all on, um, it's all documented. I'm going to try and walk two kilometers a day for 17 days straight. Um, and to raise funds for MS for MS, which is for the John Hopkins hospital. Um, it is something that is going to be, in my opinion, one of the hardest things I've ever done. And it's really hard to say because to walk two kilometers for someone is like, oh, really? But for me, walking two kilometers is like doing a, you know, a marathon of a thousand kilometers. And um, just trying to raise awareness that anything is possible. Um, you know, it is going to be hard and difficult, but it is something that I'm going to pull through. Oh, I'm sure you will. You sound like you have the determination to do it. Yeah, I do. So when you say that two kilometers is like walking 100 miles for you, what does it feel like? Is it just the fact that the side of your body is is not responding to what you're telling it to do? If, you know, it feels honestly, it feels like you're walking with a completely dead limb. So you have no feeling to lift that leg up you have no strength to lift that leg up. And when you try to lift it up, it's, it will lift up straight. It doesn't bend. It almost, I mean, if, if anyone knows of anyone who's had a stroke, um, how their right leg is like a stiff or their left leg is stiff when they're walking, that's exactly what it feels like. It's just, it feels like there is no nerve conduction on the bottom part of my hip all the way down to my toes. Now, MS is also one of those diseases that you can't see. When someone yeah. breaks a leg, when someone breaks an arm, you you can see it. Oh, they're injured, and you need to treat them as a person who has an injury. How do you find that in society where, you know, people may look at you and say, well, why don't you just exercise more? Yeah. Why don't you just eat funny. better? <laughs> yeah. It's funny you said that because two weeks ago, um, I was walking uh, from... I was in a parking garage and I had left my cane in the car um, and I was walking from the doors back to the car to get my cane because I'm like, oh no, I forgot it. Um, now, when I say walking, it was maybe 20, 30 meters. So it wasn't far at all. And I had fallen. I tripped over my foot and fallen in the garage and there was, and, and it actually really makes me pissed, but there was a family that was in the garage that looked at me like, what is this guy drunk? Like he's walking and he falls and he's literally stumbled and he's stuck on the floor and can't get up. They actually turned away and got in their car and waited till I got up, got in the car and being as embarrassed as I was, I didn't even get my cane. I got in my car and I left. So people look at someone as something is wrong with them instead of helping that person or 
even just, hey, are you okay? I mean, at the end of the day, whether that person is drunk or he's not, makes no difference. It's it's human. Um, it's the human capability of, of making sure that someone is okay. Yeah. Um, especially a- when they've fallen. So, you know, getting up and, you know, my knuckles are all, we're all bloody because, you know, you try to catch yourself or you try not to land a certain way. So you smash your head open, um, you know, but, you know, the society these days, they just don't, everyone looks out for themselves and everyone cares only about themselves. And you know what, it's, it's turned into a world that no one cares it's you know, it's so it's sad disgusting. to think that that's exactly how it is. So much of it is fear based. That family that saw you was just afraid, but it doesn't excuse yeah. their behavior. They could easily have said, or even from the car, rolled down the window and said, "Are you okay?" It just takes that yep. much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh. That's all. That's all it would have taken. Is are you okay? That's it. It's my goodness. Yeah. Can we call someone yeah. for you? You know something. Anyway, anything. Ugh. So now that you've done all this, uh, you're, you're doing work actively for MS. Yours yeah. is not the only story that you hear. Do you find nope. that no, no. there's support in the fact that there's all these other people who are suffering from this disease and in various I, stages? Oh, yeah. And you know what? I'm, and a part of our MS for our best friends, non, it's a nonprofit organization. There's everyone is and or has MS. Um, and it's funny that no two people in our foundation have the same symptoms and it's scary because you know one person let's say is eyesight one person is their left leg one person is their right leg one person is oh i slur one person is memory one person there are so many different things that can affect someone with ms and there are so many people that have ms and i've actually been now calling MS the invisible monster because someone could be walking down the street and be struggling inside mentally and they have MS and you just don't know. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. And is it true? I've, I've heard that you can actually go into a remission of sorts. You can go into a remission in a sense that you can, you still have MS. And whatever symptoms you've had will always stay with you. Uh, And that's caused by the lesions that either appear in your brain or spinal cord. Um, And what the lesions do is in, in, in normal people's terms, because uh, that's how I understand it. um, It will, the lesion affects your neurological pathways. So if a lesion is placed in a certain part of your brain and um, a nerve that, controls your leg is in the path of that lesion, your leg won't function. Mm. It's like an interruption of signal. So there are so many different things that MS now does. And I mean, are they coming closer to a cure? I think that they're working on it um, because there are medications now that, you know, will halt it in a sense that you won't, they say you won't get any worse, but as you are, it's how you'll stay. Um, I just wish this type of medication was out like back four or five years ago when I was walking normal. Um, because if someone said to me, you're going to stay as you are right now, but you'll have this pain in your arm forever. I would be like, that's totally fine with me. But since then it has progressed and now it's in the leg. Um, it's, it's painful. Okay. So the new, the, the research that you're hoping is that obviously one day they find a complete cure. And yeah. that would be just a wonderful thing. There was a cure out of Italy for a while, or they was said there was yeah. a, a, a surgery that was a cure, and that seems to have gone completely by the wayside now. It was the stem cells where they were transferring, you know, fresh stem cells into you. And I honestly think that maybe it didn't work. And I, I don't know. There are so many conspiracies about that. It was, you know, it does work, and the MS society sort of shut it down. I don't know. I don't know. It is it is a massive conspiracy that I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say, isn't it? And you don't want to say anything that gets exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah seriously, I'll have them show up at my door and be like, "Hey." <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and no one knows exactly. And sometimes something works for one person, but it doesn't work and for doesn't everyone. work for another. Yeah, correct. But that's kind of what 
MS is like, isn't it? Because everybody seems to present differently. That's right. Every single case is different. So what do you hope to accomplish in your, in your two kilometers a day endeavor? Um, Other than walking two kilometers a day. (laughs) You know why? I was even telling my wife today and I said to her, I said, I think my main goal is knowing that I can walk that two kilometers Mm -hmm. and I'll be able to come for walks. And my exact words were with you, with Bailey and with Alessia. Because every single time for the past two years, if you want to come for a walk with me, I was always, no, 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 no. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. But now it's something that I want to try doing. And if I can accomplish that, I don't have to say I can't anymore. It's I know I can do it. Right. Now, tell us a bit about your wife. When did you meet her? So I met her in 2014. Um, got married in 2016. So this is after and your diagnosis. Yes. After my diagnosis, um, so I met her in 2014, and I knew she was the one when I basically told her I had MS, and her exact words were, okay, and? (laughs) Good for her. (laughs) And I said, well, what do you mean, and? I said, do you know that one day I could be in a wheelchair? She goes, and? Yeah. She goes, my love for you ain't going to change because you're in a wheelchair, you're, you're a top athlete in the world. I couldn't care less. As long as you, as she said, as long as you love me and you love any kids that we have and you love any pets that we have, it's, well, what does it matter? And That's, from that day forward, it was, you know, it was, it, it was the real, real thing. That's wonderful. That's just yeah. wonderful. And so now you guys have a good team. Yeah. Now we have a team. Yeah. Well, one tenth of a soccer team, but we have a team. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still involved with soccer? Uh, I, with this whole COVID thing now, no, because obviously the whole soccer community in Canada is shut down. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was coaching, um, ranked second nationally, the Woodbridge Strikers under 15 team. Um, we ended up getting ranked, we ended up ranking second in the U S and Canada, which was unbelievable. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. The kids did, you know, the kids obviously had a, uh, they have an amazing strive to perform. And seeing the smiles on their faces every game they won, every tournament they won, every you know award they got was made me happy. Now, do you think your journey through MS, superstar to a guy with MS, contributes to how you coach? I think it contributes um, to the kids I'm coaching. And the reason why I say that is because um, they see how hard it is even for me to be on a field because of the fact that I'm with my cane and I'm finding it difficult. I can't even show them drills anymore, but I still will try. And it shows them that even if you can't do something, you're still going to try to do it. And I think that is a major learning point for kids. Yeah. Believe in yourself. That's it. That's all you can do is believe in yourself. And even when you don't believe in yourself, you got to really work hard to try and get that belief. And it's not going to be easy. At all. What a wonderful life lesson for those kids who are yeah. under your tutelage, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. I always figure that a coach is one of the most important people in a child's life and in their growing up. A teacher, for sure, their parents, for sure, but a coach, a good coach, is just invaluable. Correct. Yeah, having a good coach... Um, uh, someone that they could look up to um, and mentor uh, is um, is what every kid needs. Because as much as your parents are there, yeah, the kids listen to their parents. But I'm, I mean, did I listen to my parents? I mean, yes and no. But yeah, did I absolutely. always listen to my coaches? Did I always listen to my coaches? One hundred percent. Yep. It's just a different mind, a different train of thought of of someone else other than a family member. Now, do you see yourself taking on a coaching role in the future for people who have MS? I would love to. I would love to. I think that, um, I think that every single person with MS has their own story. Um, and I feel that there is a fear behind telling their story because of the fact that they just don't have the strength to say what's really going on and it's completely understandable because up until a couple of months ago I was in that situation it took me about 10 years to speak about 
my career and how the MS happened and my depression and until I finally said to myself, what difference does it make? Why not help someone that might be going through the depression, that might be going through hard times? Why not put a smile on their face? I mean, mm-hmm. there's people that, that I have, let's say on Instagram or on Facebook that have MS and I'll send them a message every once in a while. Hey, and they could be from the States. They could be from Taiwan. They can be from anywhere mm-hmm. in this world. And I'll just be like, Hey, I just want to let you know that you're an amazing person and keep doing what you're doing. And it's just that other person receiving that message for that split second had a smile on their face. Absolutely. And that's all I care about. Yeah. And it comes from someone who knows what they're going through. You know, yeah. if a person who doesn't have MS is saying, yeah, you go guy, you go for those two <laughs> kilometers a day. I mean, that's, you know, fun and nice, but for someone who understands your struggle, it's it's absolutely fantastic. It it, it would mean yeah. so much to them. Yeah, one hundred percent, one thousand percent, actually, because someone that's going through it knows how hard that two kilometer walk is, and knows how hard it is to speak about depression, knows how hard it is. So it just shows it shows that person that much more. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best of luck with your. Um, two kilometers a day. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and if you ever, ever have something that you're doing, a fundraiser or something, don't hesitate yep. to reach out because we'll be happy here on Fresh Waves to support you in any way we can and in anything that you're doing. Okay, perfect. If anyone wants to donate to MS and to your cause, um, how do they get a hold of you and how do they get a hold of your organization? So if... Um Right now for this walk, I am doing a, a GoFundMe page, um, and this will be any money raised that goes directly to the MS4MS, uh, which then goes to the John Hopkins Hospital for MS Research. Um, I don't know how it works specifically with the GoFundMe page, if it's a link or if it's just searching of the name, um, but if they do want to go on GoFundMe and they do search uh, Julian Uccello, it will come up as help Julian raise awareness for uh, MS. So it does come up on the GoFundMe page. Thanks again, Julian, and best of luck with your two kilometers a day. I hope you just end up doing two kilometers every day from then on. For the rest of my life. Absolutely. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. (laughs) It would be. It would be amazing. I think it would give us all inspiration. (laughs) No, that's, yeah, I agree. I agree 100%. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Fresh Waves, and we look forward to chatting with you again soon.